Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is Chairman and Co-Chief Investment Officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with another episode of Infinite Loops. Today, I am joined by somebody who I've wanted to have on this podcast for quite some time. I've followed him for a while. His name is Thomas J. Bevan. He is the proprietor of the Soaring 20s Social Club, as well as the author of a wonderful substack that I love called The Commonplace. Welcome, Thomas. Thanks for having me, Jim. So I'm going to jump right in media res here, and then we're going to get to the beginnings and all that kind of stuff. But I want to quote from what just grabbed me. And I said, not only do I have to subscribe, I really have to read everything this guy writes. And the title of your piece was Avoid the Middle Ground. You said, it's bland, boring, and yet often dangerous. Portmanteaus, infotainment, docudramas watched by flexitarian workaholics. The middle is multitasking and smartphone side hustles that kill leisure time. Bam! I love that. There it is. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about how this piece came to be, because we're going to talk about the piece you wrote on starting a commonplace, which, as you might know, I believe in quite a bit. But this piece especially just grabbed me and I loved it because everyone writes with weasel words today. They assume that their audience is an idiot. Exactly. Yeah. Here is what I am saying. Here is what I am saying. Here is what I said. That's just it. I mean, you end up just with anything. You end up with what you deserve pretty much in life eventually. And I just think if you take that middle path, that's just what you're going to end up with, which I guess for you as an individual, that might be fine. But if everyone does that, then collectively, everyone ends up stuck in the middle. And yeah, life just becomes that exact boring list of things that are said in the paragraph there. So yeah, whatever you're going to do, do it either one way or the other. Either try and speak to people's sort of higher selves. Or if you're going to be stupid, be completely stupid. <laughs> right. Fully commit. If that's the road you're going to take, then take that road fully, yeah. One of my theories is that the people who really make bank on Twitter are what I would call midwits. And by the way, I'm not going to name anybody, but basically they have the largest total addressable market. And I get it. I've always known that what I do, especially in my career on the investing side and then all the other crazy stuff I do, I have a really tiny audience that is self-selected. I do very little to promote this. I don't charge anything for it. It's actually an indulgent luxury for me to be able to do this, to talk to smart people like yourself. Was there something? Were you out and about planuring and you saw something or thought of something that made you think, God damn it, I'm going to go home and I'm going to really write this out? I'm going to say, to be honest, and this kind of goes with the idea of trying to avoid the middle, I try not to think things out. What I try and do, or what I end up doing, is I have like a ridiculously tight deadline, realize I'm going, oh, shit, I've 
three hours to get this done before it goes out and then do something and that's how it ends up being so I guess that kind of played on my mind for a while that one because you know if ever you're on Twitter you've got that bell curve meme that you see everywhere which I think is probably just a universal law rather than a meme and I just realized why just have a picture when you can just bang on about it for thousands of words so I thought here's the gap that's what I'll do I love it it made me fully commit to you my friend Let's talk a little bit about the whole idea of a commonplace. This is something that I am incredibly in favor of. Hugely believe in what you call a commonplace journaling, journal habit. Your advice that I love also, read voraciously and start a commonplace. The journaling habit can transform you. Explain. I just think, at least for me anyway, if you have just thoughts circling your head, they just effectively don't exist. They will as is the name of the podcast, I was Luke forever, not doing anything. And there's something to do with the actual process of starting to write things down, either whether that be your own thoughts or to generate thoughts, things that you discover from books. And yeah, from that, it actually becomes a process of starting to get to know yourself and what you actually think. And because if you do in a commonplace context, there's no audience component, that kind of begins to generate in a very low pressure situation the first few steps towards becoming a writer. So I think if anyone is starting out or has an interest, that's got to be the first step towards this. I totally agree. And a lot of people have asked me, so how do I start this? Give me the list. And I said, there is no list. You just start writing. And as you just pointed out, you're only writing for yourself initially. So one of the things that I love about it and why I do it so much is because I think that writing your thoughts out makes you pretty quickly understand whether you know what the fuck you're talking about or not. (laughs) And so sometimes I'll like be, well, I think this, and then I'll start writing it. And I'll, ooh, I don't think this. Do you find that occurs with you as well? I've got this really bad habit. I've learned how to develop the style. So I sort of sound on the surface like I know what I'm talking about. But when you actually read it closely, I just don't at all. So that's quite a dangerous trap, just being able to pontificate and do all of that. But yeah, like I say, it's only when something's outside of your head that it becomes real. And it's only through that that you actually be able to look back on yourself or be able to see yourself from a more detached viewpoint. And then that's when you can see if you're full of shit or not. So one of my heroes is Richard Feynman, the physicist. And he says, be careful not to be fooled because you are the easiest person to fool yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And so we're very simpatico on that because and you wrote a piece on this, we are also unreliable narrators, especially where memory is concerned, in my opinion. One of the reasons why I cherish having all of these is it's a wonderful tonic to be called a liar in your own handwriting. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. One of the things that I think our human OS operating system does as a kindness is that it automatically updates and rewrites, overwrites things that we think are memories. But actually, if we are thinking about them now, it fills in to be consistent with what we think now. So for example, Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers, people were crazy excited about that, right? No, it wasn't even a big deal in the news. It was like, these guys are playing with toys. So one of the things that you say is that Almost out of necessity, any discussion, advice on writing is going to be false. And any narrative of any kind, of any tense, is a study in human nature. I love that line. So talk to me about that particular piece, because one other thing that I think fits in really well, it's a quote, I think. Let the audience add up two plus two. They'll love you. And I immediately think of O'Brien in 1984, two plus two equals five. So that rung incredibly true to me. Thoughts, please. Well, yeah, I guess I'm more on the idea of being an unreliable narrator just in life. That is the main beauty of the commonplace as a thing to do as a system, which is why I started doing them personally. Because, yeah, you just find you might read all these books, but you can very easily get into the habit of a surface skim and then you just forget. And if you forget, what's the point? And I suppose if you build up any sort of intelligence sadly you seem to use that intelligence against yourself and you just become this really intricate like self-rationalizing machine which is probably an inevitable human thing and i suppose the only way out is that sort of socratic way of realizing that 
I think that's probably all you can do is if you become aware of that, then that's enough of a mitigation. So you can at least live with yourself in that way because you know you are full of shit. You know your mind will always change. And yes, you're not going to get caught up always having one consistent set of views, which never change. As the world changes and details change, ultimately that's death, isn't it? There's nothing worse than just being stuck on the same route. And that probably happens in consequence of you are this unreliable narrator. And to try and prevent that, if you aren't willing to be humble enough to accept that, you become more and more rigid and build a worldview that you stick to even when the circumstances change. And yeah, the only way out of that is humility of sort of awareness. I honestly, and I'm saying this maybe truthfully, haha. Who knows? <laughs> I just can't understand why people are reluctant to do this. I think of a quote by the writer, who's not a real person, by the way, Jed McKenna. But what he says in the quote is, the unexamined life is not worth living. And then he goes on to say, holy shit, that's a really scary concept. I bet most people freak out when they read just that quote. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Why do you think that is? Is it because we hope for control? We hope for hearth and home, the Rockwell vision of a happy family, happy life, all these things? Or is it because fear, which in my opinion, remains the base driving emotion of we humans, has just made us so terrified to even look over the cliff, much less jump? Mm -hmm. It's the fear of change because the certain people say it's comfort. It's not even comfort. It's just there's a kind of familiarity of the known. And it feels like that's the way to be, to stay where you are, stay consistent in your views. The world becomes understandable. And it's when you first take on those views, that's probably true. And things stay static for quite a while, but then you have a seismic change in the world. And if you haven't built any sort of either mental apparatus to understand things, or at least epistemic humility to be, yeah, everything I thought before was wrong in light of this new information. It seems like a good strategy, but like any strategy that involves just being static eventually it ends up catastrophically failing but in the short term because it feels more comfortable than the initial difficulty of change that's why people stay there i've always thought that stasis equals death and if i could get people to understand that but again i don't try because i can't change anybody i fully understand that you can change only yourself you might be able to help somebody you might be able to point the way But I passionately believe that the only one who can change you is you. And so you had written a piece that I also really enjoyed, Listicles. I had done a real rant that I wrote right on the app because I'd been reading one of these idiotic things. And the reason I clicked on it was I was curious. I was actually curious. What are they trying to foist on people here? And this particular one was something like the 10 habits that all millionaires do. And I'm immediately offended by the headline. All X don't ever. Yeah, I've tried to avoid those things for years because they're awful. But like you say, that generally the actual topic itself is something that could potentially have some worth if it were written by a human rather than like a human robot. So you see the headline, you think, oh, that looks quite good. I'll give it the benefit of a doubt. And then you just read it. And yeah, if it's anything that you've got any knowledge or experience on whatsoever, you're just like, well, that's wrong. That's the opposite of my experience. This is why I started against my own better judgment, writing sort of longer essays about writing itself, just because I had so many bones to pick with the received wisdom of all. I don't really prize editing half as much as most people do. I don't know if it makes me a better thinker in the way that everyone seems to claim these things do. Because all these points of what writing online is all about, I'm just like, that doesn't seem to be applicable because like the millionaires, we're not all the same. Right, we're all different. Yeah, and the difference is interesting, but that seems to get lost in these sort of signalling little, not even ideology, just mini views, which then become mimetically sort of correct. And from that, that view just gets spread. Any sort of nuance or actual useful information from an actual practitioner just gets drowned out because it doesn't sound as good as these nice sound bites. I've written four books. And in that regard, I do find editing to be helpful. 
because I can go on. <laughs> and sometimes a helpful editor slapping my wrist with a ruler saying, you don't have to tell them 10 times the same thing works out. But then I started writing letters to my kids when my son was just a few days old. And I would give them all the letters. I have three kids. So I would give them all the letters on their 21st birthday. And I was reading the second entry that I put in was against editing because I had read the first letter I wrote and I didn't like some of the things I'd said or the way I put them. So above it, in all caps, I wrote original version. I can't remember what I said. But then as I was thinking about it, I'm like, well, if I took this out or this out or this out, it's going to lose all of the meaning. So meaning is often found in the mistakes. Or in digressions. Or in digressions, exactly. You can see this painting right behind me. Mm -hmm. Some people that I do the pod with really love it and they ask about it. And there's really a great story about it. Us visiting the artist and she was dying of pancreatic cancer. I remember that I wrote it down, my visit, because I was really struck by her. And A, again, unreliable narrator. I did love her, but I thought I didn't live here in the East Coast yet. Of course, I did. And so I was reading all of the journals from 1988, 89, 90, right before I moved here. I'm like, fuck, I know that I wrote this down and I know that it was from this period. And then I thought, now, will you pay attention to your own advice? And so I went and I read the later and there it was. But the point is, it was a great story that I was able to capture the moment I got back to my house right after I met with her. And it was beautiful. And so those things are by their very nature, they're written more, in my opinion, to learn and to keep as messages and thoughts about in your own life. Let me ask you a question. If you were going to publish all of the stuff that you've written so far for The Commonplace, all the essays, not the film reviews or that stuff, but the essays, would you want an editor to go through them? Well, I can answer that because they will be coming out soon, the first 50. Oh, fantastic. And I guess basically the spell check. <laughs> I love it. When are they coming out? Congratulations. That's awesome. I've still got to work out the details because I'll be just publishing myself and I'm looking to do like a limited, probably 100 person signed hardback run first. Count me in which I'm hoping to do pretty quickly. But, you know, with all the things happening in the world, I just think if this has got to be shipped all over the world and Christmas is coming, do I do this now and it gets lost in the post forever or do I wait until start of next year, this kind of thing? But anyway, that'll be happening in some capacity soon. And then after that, it'll just be the standard Amazon and digital route. Wow, that's great. And you decided to do that because of the impermanence of the web, the fact that, Every tweet I've ever tweeted doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Jack. Mm -hmm. And I love Spotify, but all those songs belong to Toby, not me. I was talking to a very young person who, he's an artist, who I've supported, by the way. And he was here pitching me on, he's got a gallery that's a cooperative on 20th Street in Manhattan. If you know Manhattan, that's a really cool area. And he was here with his partner and they were saying, our hook here is that we have no social media at all. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. You guys want to ultimately monetize this, right? I mean, no social media, nothing, no Instagram. And the answer that they gave, I thought was really good and clever. That got me thinking about it. I'm 61. And for most of my life prior to the internet, you had to show up. You wanted a book, you went to the bookstore. And you oftentimes ended up buying books that you didn't go there to buy. It was just the browsing that allowed you, ooh, this looks interesting. I like this. I still do that, even though I read mostly on Kindle, just because it's easier for me to do. When I used to travel, my book bag weighed 50 or 60 pounds. And so the further they went into it, they were like, no, 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 just to frame it. They're both, I think, 24. And they said, no, 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 people our age crave actual human contact, but they also take a little bit of pleasure in they were there and friend XYZ or friends XYZ worked. And so he told me about his first show, completely just word of mouth. That was it. 225 people showed up. And of course, they are all Instagramming it. But the point that they made was that it made them even more enticing because scarcity. 
if it's scarce and nobody knows about it, it's really cool to be able to be part of that scene. I think that, and you wrote something about it, we're going to talk about it a little bit. I definitely think that a blend of online and offline is maybe the right mix, at least for me, maybe not for everybody, because I'm a tech freak too. I early adopted all technology because the power is in the network. And by that, I mean, I started thinking about Van Gogh. And if you've ever seen any of his work, it's brilliant. At least I think it's brilliant. And then I started thinking to myself, now, this is only my theory. Okay. So scholars out there, I'm just spitballing here. Okay. But he had no network. His brother, Theo, was his art dealer. Theo had no connections, none. And so if your rep is a single person, your brother, who doesn't really know anyone or really go out of his way to try to promote your work or know the business, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to sell any fucking paintings. And so I definitely think there's huge value in the network. Isn't that kind of why you came back on Twitter? Yeah. I'm going to try and hit a few different points here. First of all, with the Van Gogh thing, I believe that he briefly knew Gauguin, who could have helped him, but he managed to piss him off. And again, our historians will probably correct that, but that's my understanding. So No, I think that's right. I completely lose your point about the network. And also, to go right back to the very start of what we were talking about, it's all about avoiding the middle. So that example you gave of the people who promoted their art and weren't online at all, that's very much one way. And you can go very much the other way and be completely cutting edge online with networks. And that's great too. But the trap that you can fall into is being right in the middle, which is where you're on Twitter all day, but you're not actually doing anything of means with it. You're just being the sharecropper for the algorithm, putting things out which don't help you, don't really help anyone else, and just end up becoming trapped. It's weird because even though ostensibly that's kind of creative, it's in reality much more of a consumer sort of approach, if you like. And yet, again, as with so many other things, that's when you're trapped in the middle. So if you avoid that, either through one extreme or the other, then that's when you're going to get somewhere. And I suppose a good way to do that would be going back to the art show again. Everything seeming to be very, very much online. The actual markets for physical books, for vinyl, for all these tangible things are actually increasing and have been increasing for a number of years now. So I think the key is rather than being in the middle, it's to try and do these two diametrically opposed things at the same time. And through that, you get a new synthesis. And that's where I suppose things become interesting. With coming back to Twitter, even though I'm sure I've got the smallest account of anyone who's ever appeared on this podcast or ever will, if you use these things sensibly and kind of in proportion, and yet there is enough there for it to be worthwhile if you don't fall into the terrible trap of this thing. I think one of the things about it is it really depends on the person. So I have specific goals or had specific goals with moving to social media from traditional media. I used to do a lot of traditional media, TV, newspaper interviews, et cetera. And in 2016 or 17 or thereabouts, I was just noticed this undeniable trend that the reason that the traditional journalists and whatnot were all having these epic emotional meltdowns is because they realize they're no longer the vaunted gatekeeper. So one of the things that I love about the internet, you actually wrote a piece about it called The Internet is Our Paris. And one of the things that I love is that that's true. In a pre-internet world, I'd never meet you. I wouldn't see what you'd written. Exactly, yeah. And so I look at it as this wonderful menu that you need to curate. I want to stress that. But where you can meet and read people like I found you, for example, like I found a lot of the people that have been on this podcast. And to me, that is a big step forward in terms of geography collapsing everything and whatnot. But you wrote something else, I think it was for the sovereign individual, which I wanted to talk to you about. You wrote, we are all gamblers at heart as we make bets on the future with words and deeds. I want to talk to you about the idea of words as labels and label thinkers. So I was going to write a thread and use betting as my analogy. But the reason I chose not to do that was because that I knew that I would have to dig through 300 tweets that said, so you're saying, which by the way, you instantly muted. 
if you say, so you're saying to me, I mute you instantly. But because of label thinking, they would say, so you're saying that investing is gambling. I don't think gambling is right. Therefore, fill in the blank. Do you think a lot about the way that people think in labels and not with original eyes, I guess I'd say? I suppose the problem becomes not necessarily the label itself, but I think what's happening there is you're trying to use something metaphorically or as an analogy, which it's always a great way to look at something through the lens of something else. You know, if I was ever to talk about writing, I don't think I'd talk about in terms of writing, you kind of compare it to a sport or some other activity. And then that way that frames in a different way. And I think what happens is you've got a certain set of people who have that capacity to talk about things metaphorically and read things as if it were a metaphor. But these certain buzzwords and linguistic things from certain domains people latch onto as signifiers and then they only use them in the most literal sense and almost don't have that capacity to sort of shift the context of seeing that you're trying to explain something in terms of another and the internet might well foster it but it's this bizarre sort of literalism which you just encounter all the time it's just maddening i don't know what has caused it i don't know what the solution is but it's just those guys in the replies you know so you need to be very aggressive in your curation, as far as I'm concerned. Or just stay obscure. That's my strategy. Just go on the radar, stay obscure. You might not stay obscure. I don't know about that. What I like about you and what you write is you hit on many of the things that I think and write about a lot. And I think that this was in the same piece, the sovereign individual piece, where you said something along the lines of feudal serfdom seemed inevitable right up until the m- moment it wasn't. And it made me think of two things that made me think of Heraclitus and his everything is change. The same man can't step in the same river because the river is different and so is the man. But it also made me think about Bucky Fuller, who said, you're never going to be able to change an existing status or way of doing things using its own terms. What Bucky said was that you have to change the model, build a new model which antiquates and makes obsolete the old one. And I think one of the ways people can do that is doing what you're doing, writing essays on a variety of thoughts that ultimately become a body of thought that makes other people think and so on. I guess this is a question about your goal. Was this just something that you just was like, God, I really just got to do this? Or was it, huh, maybe I could do this and earn a living as a writer and be a flaneur, and that'd be really cool. What was your thinking? I think it was the former, and then it became the latter when it became a bit more viable, because I think people always have this idea, this goal-orientated idea, and you build up a certain level, and then you get to like a lifestyle that you want. My lifestyle was time freedom, and I got that in my mid-20s by just giving in. So why earn the money to retire when you can just mentally retire when you're 25? So because I had a lot of time, it was just pure sort of expression and things like this didn't have any kind of goal or motivation really besides if people read it and they like it, it doesn't matter the number, just some sort of engagement, that would be good. And I think because I approached it in that way rather than like a much more instrumental, metric-driven sort of way, I think because of that, that resonated with some people. And then as a result of that, the numbers build up in such a way. It's like, oh, if I turn the money thing on here, then, yeah, that might be a chance to make a living, which seems to be how it's going, which is fantastic. But, yeah, it's that thing where I don't think you can ever approach anything like that directly, especially anything that's got any sort of artistic component. Like if you decide I'm going to make a living, I'm going to make X amount of money, you'll either A, fail, or B, you'll kind of dilute and kill the goose that lays the gold like in the process of doing it. So, yeah, initially... It was just pure expression, just kind of saying what's on my mind. But as a result of that, I guess that is what made it resonate with people. And then that made the second way possible. I agree, by the way, making things conditional is not a good way to think about them. If I achieve X, then I will be happy. If I don't do Y, then I will, you know, don't make your life conditional. And don't, again, I think we were coming back to the fear of the middle Don't be that person. My friend Alex Danko has the office social hierarchy theory of humanity. And the original British office was, of course, brilliant. 
with Ricky Gervais. And I must say, even the American version was pretty brilliant too, because it's just a massive satire on who we are and everything there. I'm a huge believer that comedians are the truth tellers of our era. And that I think it was Billy Wilder who said it. If you want to tell people the truth, you better be funny or they'll fucking kill you. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So do you have any trepidations about putting it out there? Not really, because I just kind of thought, who cares? You know, it's not as if to be cancelled and attacked by a mob, you have to first be a known quantity. So who cares? And I think one thing that the internet has done, especially that very centralised web to kind of thing, going back to the listicles idea, is it's kind of de-skilled people in terms of their general reading ability. And so I'm never going to annoy anyone because it's actual paragraphs. So I've already weeded people out. It's not a problem. It's fine. (laughs) I love that. Where are the pictures? Yeah. (laughs) I would like you to tell me a little bit about the Roaring Twenties Social Club. What's that all about? That is, and I think this is generally the way the world is going, is it seems that as things increasingly decentralize, which is the main thing of Web3, is that people seem to be forming more sort of smaller private communities, often via Discord, which is what my social club is. And so as part of signing up for the premium Substack, you get entry to the club, which is a bunch of writers, artists, poets, designers, just general layabouts and idlers. <laughs> my, my people. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so over the course of like a year or so, I've been trying to just lasso the kind of people who get what I'm saying and aren't completely caught up in that hustle culture or don't want to be anymore. And so, yeah, just corral them into this online salon we've created. And then, yeah, we just hang out. The kind of people who want help with the writing, we do that aspect and just so on and so forth. And that is what you get for being part of my premium Substack. So there is a tiny, tiny little charge there. And that just enables me to earn a living so I can just write what I want to write without compromise, have time for all the people there, and sort of on we go. If you don't mind my asking, where are you in the continuum of your commonplace Substack and the Roaring Twenties Social Club is making X amount of money for you? Are you at a place where you can do just that? Or is that still a little ways off? Just about. Just about. Well, congratulations. That's very cool. That is one of the things that I love about Web 3.0 is that people can do that, which I think is fantastic. And I think it will lead to, again, referencing why all the journos now are melting down, is because all of the best people are leaving that world and setting up their own Substack or podcast or whatever, and they're making bank. Not all of them are making bank, but people are making enough to make a living. It's certainly possible. Yeah. And so I love that because... Talk about something that levels the playing field for creative people. Yeah. And I think for the most part, it's actually meritocratic, it seems. I agree. But that's a whole different subject. I've been doing a deep dive on complex adaptive learning systems, which are mostly anything that we use (laughs) or have invented. And there's this thing that is true for bacteria and true for the stock market. And that is the Matthew effect. And what that means is in in a network node of learning, the nodes that are more correct on making predictions attract a lot of additional connections and the nodes that don't die. And so the Bible quote is, I don't know it exactly, but it's something along the lines of those, to he who has more will be given to those who have not, even what little they have will be taken away from them. It's really brutal, but it does seem in fact to be operating at every level from bacteria all the way up to the most advanced social systems. And so one of the ways that I think that Web 3.0 can maybe negate that a little bit is it can provide a platform for people who are not maybe the loudest node, right, getting all the connections. But as you say, meritocracy, it would not surprise me if we did another talk a year from now and you had double the subscribers. Because what happens is the node, i.e. you, attract someone like me who would be an amplifier 
And then other people see it and they're like, well, I want him on my podcast too, or I want to write about him. That talent is basically what gets rewarded there. So it can sound brutal, but I don't know. It seems like if we were going to apply that to sport, can you imagine your favorite football team just picking people off the street? It would be horrible. You wouldn't go and watch. You also wrote in a piece that I really thought was fantastic, Diving for Pearls. You quoted Nietzsche. Basically, you said, he who has a why can withstand almost any how. You're only going to be able to endure something if it is in some way meaningful for you, which is just the fundamental thing of life, really, how you manage to get on, how you manage to survive if you don't have a sense of meaning or a sense of purpose attached to the action in question, then it was peter away. That's what keeps you going. And was that a self-referential quote? I think so to a degree. Yeah, I think that's something that you learn because suffering of one form or another is going to be an inevitability of life. That's certainly what I found. And I suppose kind of in the essay when it's called Diving for Pearls, it's to do with these cliches of how writers and other artistic type people seem to be quite depressive and things of that nature. And I argue that is part of it, kind of going to the depth, if you like, to extract the pearl. And that's the meaning. And you bring that back to the surface and share that with the collective, which is fine if you're aware that that is what you're doing. Because then as part of that, you can actually have sort of processes and things in place to deal with the stress of that. I think I kind of made a comparison of the bends when you come up too quickly and whatnot. These things are worthwhile and these things are endurable if you have a self-defined meaning behind them and i think that is the purpose of and the way to get through the creative act so the other thing that i've seen in all social systems that i've analyzed be they sun kings or parliaments or whatever it seems to me that one could spin the way things come out as a conspiracy as you know, these people up here are telling us, oh, don't be Icarus, don't fly too close to the sun, and be mediocre. And I think that it's a naturally occurring phenomenon. And I think that when you look at religions, gee, they also help keep social order. Who would have thought? So I sometimes think that the more change agents, as I would call you, for example, and myself, actually, the better. Because it's the only way it, you get uncomfortable, as you in your essay pointed out, you go up too fast, you get the bends, you die. Mm -hmm. But without it, stasis and entropy enter the game and it's kind of kaput. So you get this learned helplessness. And when people have a learned helplessness, they are totally surrendering their agency. And I, for better or worse, think that the only way anyone is going to make it in the world, not just this world, almost any world, is by not surrendering their agency. And so that is why I get attracted to writers like you and other people who are saying really interesting things, very thoughtful things that make me question my own thinking on any number of matters. Do you think it's an archetype? When you're doing your Roaring Twenty Social Club, do you see an archetype there? God, that's hard to say. It's a really good question. I suppose there's probably a cluster of archetypes because there's going to be certain fundamental shared interests. It's not very much like all of one temperament necessarily, I would say. I mean, obviously, it's going to skew somewhat towards introversion, but it's the internet. You kind of take that as a given pretty much. But yeah, it's interesting. I think a lot of limitations, to go back to the other point, is that the kind of environmental to a degree, but it's almost like self-imposed within that. Like you've got the orthodoxy and the status quo of the environment, what I've called in one of my essays, the wall in the head, whereas it feels like your environment is sort of walled. And I think it's more of an English thing, to be honest. There's more sort of limitations on who you are and what you can be in the kind of world you live in, these kind of things. I have a lot of English friends, and that is very true. America has many, many, many faults, but one of them is not the idea that anyone can come here and if they build a better mousetrap can in a generation become either extraordinarily wealthy or influential or whatever they want. So maybe my priors are because I was born here, but I think it might be also a function of language and accent, quite frankly. Yeah, 
that's definitely the component through which the class system manifests itself, you know? Yep, absolutely. And as you might expect, I am opposed. I don't think that that makes sense. So my wife is a street photographer and literally, Thomas, she will walk 15 to 20 miles a day. And I have seen every European capital from London to Paris to Berlin on foot. (laughs) And I love it, actually, to be honest, uh, because it is the only way to truly understand a city. Yeah, absolutely. Have you read the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? A long, long time ago. I think his insights are quite compelling. And one of the things he makes the point that if you're whizzing by in a car, it's maybe like your wall of the mind. You're just in your own little capsule and you're not really seeing it. Seeing London, for example, one of my favorite European cities, Paris, on foot, vastly different impression. You really can't get it any other way, I don't think. So how much do you walk it? Is that where you get your best ideas? I probably do a couple of hours a day, sometimes less, but yeah, the walk is absolutely has to happen. I don't own a car, for example, or anything like this. So definitely have to walk just to buy food or go to the library, get books, all this kind of thing. And yeah, it's where you have the best ideas. Definitely. It's something to do with motion. I think just something to do with the actual act of motion, and fresh air and all these kind of things, because you naturally find yourself ruminating at the speed that you're walking at. And you don't even realize you have problems or thoughts, but they'll just come to you and you'll try and solve them. And then, yeah, after you've done an hour's walk, you just sit home, start writing, and it just pretty much inevitably comes. Yeah, that's how I actually got the idea for my first two books was on long walks. Is it a desultory stroll or do you go with a purpose? Do you have a place that you're walking to or do you just kind of walk? It's kind of both insofar as like i said whether it be some food or the library or whatever there'll be vague sort of destinations but there's not a set route i know i kind of need to be like over there which is a mile away but i might go this way and then back that way and then do some sort of really convoluted circuit and then end up at the destination which in of itself informs the writing and as far as if you read my stuff it starts here yeah we go on a massive tangent here. <laughs> right. You'll notice we always get where we're going. Yep. Bingo. Okay. So you have the books coming out. You have subscriptions getting real close to making it so you could have a living. Any further aspirations? Or are you happy just being able to write what you want to write without any interference? That's perfect. That's kind of the foundation. And then I think from then, the real work starts. There's definitely got to be a lot more fiction so like early middle last year i put out some short stories which went well but i need to get back on that train which that'll happen once i've got the time from this being a full-time living and yeah more essays more reviews more stories collections fiction i love it well this has been fantastic you want to just tell our listeners how they can find you the sub stack is Thomas J. Bevan, that's T-H-O-M-A-S-J-B-E-V-A-N dot substack dot com. And you can sign up for free or you can give me money. If you're an aristocrat of the soul, you can do that. And yeah, the Twitter, that's Thomas J. Bevan. But the E in Bevan is a three. And yeah, they're the two main places you'll find me. But of the two, it's got to be the substack all day long. Yep, I would agree. And we will put that in the show notes. Well, in closing, we always ask our guests this question, and we've gotten some really interesting responses. So here we go. No pressure. Thomas, we are making you the emperor of the world only for one day. You can't kill anyone, and you can't put anyone in a re education camp. Have you seen the movie Inception? Yeah. Okay. You can incept the entire population of the globe. So they're going to wake up the next day having two ideas that they're going to think they thought of and that they're going to pursue. What are you going to accept in the world's population? So I think what I would do is I would implant nothing. So the day after, possibly for the first time in a long time, everyone in the world just does nothing for one day. Just a day off, universal day off. Then maybe you'll realize that your life needs to change. Maybe you'll just be able to relax, you know, but for that one day, just nothing. So the inception would be 
they're going to all wake up and say, you know what? Everyone's having a day off tomorrow. Everyone's having a day off. I like that idea. Okay, what's the next one? So it's got to be something that's universal, but because people are listening, it's got to be not incredibly boring and cliche. So that is diametrically opposed as well. Okay, so what I want is even though everyone's having a day off and doing nothing, they've got one thing to do, which is they need to make something. doesn't matter what it is, whether it be a poem or a painting, making something, record a song, some kind of creative thing which they need to make. And then the next day, they give it to someone else with no expectation of return. I love that. That's really great. That's something that would ripple, but not in like an awful destroy the world kind of way. So that's the only way I can see of tackling the awful burden of your question. So I love that you approach the question that way, because so many times in history, the people who do the most damage to humanity always are claiming they're doing it for their best interests. Yeah. So I love the fact that you pause. I'm just trying not to be a tyrant. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Well, Thomas, this has been really fun. Thank you for coming on Infinite Loops. Going to keep reading you, and we look for some great stuff. Thank you for having me, John.